So this is the policy and practice seminar hosted by UCL's uh, political science department. Uh, I'm Richard McMahon. I lecture in EU politics in the department, also on um, the rise of global China, which is kind of more like why I'm, I'm here. I'll be chairing this uh, event this evening. So the title is uh, Chinese Economic Diplomacy, and I expect you're here because you're keenly following uh, China, the rise of China, um, and, and you recognize how important economics is to, to that and to the, the, to the, to the big questions. Um, its importance for international relations, and especially with the worsening relations between China and the West, China and, 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 and the US. Um, for me, I suppose I've got three pressing questions that I'm really hoping to find out something about uh, tonight. Maybe you share these concerns. Um, one is that it looks like a moment now with the, 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 the problems of, um, uh, of demography in the longer term and more short term, uh, with the, uh, the construction sector, uh, youth unemployment, that perhaps this long economic boom since uh, reform and opening up in the 1980s, is that now coming to, coming to an end? Um, and then, um, how does that interact uh, and how do economic and, uh, and political, geostrategic um, issues interact with one another uh, in the context of the worsening relations between the West and, uh, and China? Um, the, co the technological competition, the, the, the efforts by the US to, to, to block China's economic development, if that is what is happening. Um, these ideas of decoupling, de-risking, dual circulation. Um, uh, and, and especially um, how these all things, these things all interact together, the economic difficulties and the uh, international tensions, how they are affecting China's foreign policy ambitions, and especially crucial foreign policy initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative and the internationalization of the, of the renminbi. So to discuss these kind of topics, um, we've got three wonderful speakers here uh, who work on that intersection between uh, uh, Chinese economics and politics. Um, I'll, I'll introduce them in, in the order in which they'll make their opening remarks. So we have in the middle here, this is Diana Choileva. Choileva, am I pronouncing it okay? Choileva. Choileva, okay, thank you. Um, she's a, a leading expert on, on China's uh, economy and, and politics, chief econo uh, economist at Enodo Economics which she set up in 2016 as an independent macroeconomic and political forecasting company to assess China and its global impact. She's analyzed China since 2000, co-authored three books. She's a non-executive director at JP Morgan Asia Growth and Income PLC, and also a non-resident senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute Center for China Analysis, focusing on the Chinese economy. Um, then here we've got um, uh, Dr. Julia uh, Shorati, who is uh, a fellow at the IR Department, International Relations Department at the London School of uh, Economics and Political Science, or the LSE. Uh, Julia's research focuses on questions of immaterial power and states image building, um, investigating visual narratives, investigating narratives but expressed in a visual form, um, and the instrumentalization of shared memory in uh, diplomacy. In practice, what she studies, so empirically, she's focused on China's self-representation to the global south um, uh, through cultural products, such as documentaries and, and, uh, and museum um, uh, exhibitions. And uh, uh, Dr. Yu Jie, um, uh, she's a senior research fellow on, on China at Chatham House. Um, uh, she focuses there on the decision-making processes in Chinese foreign policy and Chinese economic uh, diplomacy. And uh, perhaps many of you, like me, would have often heard her on, in podcasts and on the radio because she's uh, frequently commenting in major media outlets like the BBC News or, or um, the Financial Times. She also regularly briefs senior policy practitioners from uh, G20 members and advises major FTSE 100 corporates and leading European financial institutions on China's political landscape. And then finally, she's a, a young leader for the Asian Security Summit Shangri-La Dialogue. So, first we're going to have the speaker's opening remarks, um, then a panel discussion, uh, and then finally we'll open the floor 
to, uh, uh, to your questions. Um, there's one final note that I'll make, that the whole session, including the Q&A portion, is going to be recorded. Uh, this will be posted online at, on the website of the department, our podcast, and, um, and our YouTube channel. So if you speak, you'll be heard, unless you, like me, you don't know how to use a microphone properly. Um, and if you don't speak, you won't be heard, so you'll be fine. Um, uh, we let you know when the recording is available, and um, uh, you're very, very welcome to share that with, um, uh, uh, with, with others. Okay, so with no further ado, I will turn you over to, um, to Diana to start. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and I'm more comfortable standing up. Uh, not only because uh, Xi Jinping has now declared uh, to the rest of the world that China stood up tall in the East, but just more generally, I find it more comfortable. And um, Richard, of course, summarized or, or gave you a huge list of questions that he wants the answer to that he gave to us as well. And then he said, and your opening remarks, only seven minutes. So somehow, in seven minutes, um, obviously, all I can do is really um, paint, uh, hopefully, an overall picture that we can delve into in much more detail. And China is a vast topic. Um, I never set out uh, to be a China expert, just ended up accidentally becoming one. And I've been doing it for more than two decades, and I would still not call myself a China expert. Uh, uh, but I'm certainly uh, an economist. Um, and I always like to say that an economist is quite like being a detective. You have to collect as many pieces of information as possible. You have to know what exactly they are. And then you have to put them together into the same coherent picture. And the more pieces you manage to fit into the same picture, the more confident you get that you have the right story. So hopefully, all of us today will be able to do that for you, give you pieces of the puzzle, the ones that are important in our view, but also bring them together into an overall idea of where China is going. Now, I want to start, as this was framed around 10 years on from the Belt and Road Initiative, where is China? What is it trying to achieve with its economic diplomacy? And ever since Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, he has gradually moved away China from Deng Xiaoping's idea of hide and bide. And during after he consolidated power during the party congress in 2017, he declared to the world that China stands up tall in the East. And from the very start of his rule, he's talked about his vision for global governance and China's role in it, called the community of uh, common, either destiny or future, depends uh, how That's people translate it. We can have a whole debate on that particular point as well for mankind. The term was very vague and originally not really paid attention to by most uh, commentators or analysts. And actually, even to this day, is not as well defined. But it's taken a much clearer shape. And from the very start, the Belt and Road Initiative was, if you'd like, the tool through which uh, China was beginning to wield its global power. However, the BRI has changed, or its focus is changing fundamentally, I would argue to you, uh, in the last few years. In the first part, it was a little bit as well of a period of trial and error where she himself didn't have an exactly an idea of how this would work and what the outcomes will be. And the focus was on building out infrastructure and connectivity in the developing world with a kind of no strings attached funding in parts of the world where China was the only game in town, for example, like Africa. Originally, China sort of achieved a lot of success, but 
from its own perspective, not just from the narrative that's been discussed in the West or that's been focused on in the West, it ended up um, in, in kind of debt traps and, and trying to consider that really were they investing their money uh, as wisely as they should. But another important aspect to this was the expectation that they will be giving out these loans for these projects in yuan. And that never materialized. The majority, if not all of these BRI loans, are in US dollars. Now, with the Ukraine invasion and the very severe financial sanctions that the US and allies imposed on Russia, it became an even bigger imperative for China to de-dollarize and to move away from its reliance on the dollar in terms of trade. So it's part of that, and it's part also of China's desire to move away from its investment-led growth model and focus on a consumer-led growth, growth model. It is starting to change the focus of its BRI outreach. It is focusing much more on what I will call uh, a closed loop. Um, two years ago, we uh, did a publicly available, most of our work is for paying clients, but we do some policy work. We did a big report on China's quest for financial self-reliance, how Beijing plans to decouple from the dollar-based global trading and financial system. This is publicly available. You can find it uh, on our site and download it. But when we were looking more overall of how the strategy for internationalizing the currency is morphing, this came out as a clear theme. What they are trying to do in order to get the yuan circulating much more internationally is to export production process, if, 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 if you'd like, rather than building out infrastructure purely. So the idea is that the Chinese bank will lend a loan in yuan to, I don't know, Saudi Arabia. They will use that to buy the machinery and equipment to build a plant which would then be producing goods that will be sold back into China. All of this conducted in renminbi and obviously at the end of the loop, so a closed loop of, of using the yuan, ending up with lowering the cost of transacting in yuan, which is one of the key problems of, that China needs to overcome in terms of moving away from its dependence on the dollar. And also China studied very carefully Japan's experience and concluded that one of the reasons why Japan didn't succeed with making its currency more usable internationally was because they never became the source of final demand. They were always the throughput of the assembly, if you'd like, at that time when Japan was, or China, well, when Japan was where China is now. And the final consumer was always the US. So from its own point of view, and again, considering that China is so gigantic, We've never observed any other economy of that size trying to catch up. The catch-up growth model has worked for those countries who were proportionally actually much smaller than the rest of the world. Because China is so big, it can't rely on this catch-up growth model because it you know, grows fast for seven years, dominates global manufacturing in low value added. And at Enodo Economics, we pioneered the thesis of the great decoupling, um, and we have written extensively on it over the last six years, even bought the domain name, thegreatdecoupling.com. I learned in my career earlier that it's not enough to get things right. You just have to be good at PR as well. So anyway, um, China is focused on developing its own consumer demand for its own reasons of how to escape from this dependence of its size 
because it can't just export to the rest of the world. You know, a few years ago when we were developing the great decoupling, we were, we were saying, yes, they want to rise up the value added chain, but what, in another seven years' time, they'll dominate all the global manufacturing? That's not viable, even from the point of view of geopolitical considerations. And we all know where we ended um, now, so very much in that boat. So they need to develop their own consumer demand, but they're doing precisely the wrong things to, to achieve that. So as a result, we're not seeing that. And that's the big question which sort of leads in to Julia's presentation, which is, if I'm right after me, yeah. correct? Because a lot of the appeal of China to the global south, obviously from the point of view of the West, mm. the appeal of China has changed quite dramatically. But from the point of view of the global south, whether China will continue to grow and more importantly will transform into the final demand, the source of final demand, is critical. So Julia will take it on in that direction, but just how long do I have so I know what to off the time? So Finn. No, over time. Over time. So that's it. I'll stop here. All right, thank you very much, and thank you so much for this great introduction. That was not planned. Um, and thank you for the organizers for having me today. Um, I'd like to contribute to this puzzle that has already been settled on for you with some new few extra pieces that are not usually central into our discussion of China's economic statecraft. I, I did teach, teach a class last term entirely, its entire model on China Global South and economic statecraft was much more tied towards more material um, endeavors. But I'm going to walk you through and try to work you through a different dimension of how China's economic growth has actually entered into its own foreign policy and diplomacy. Of course, there are several approaches for that. So we've been looking as scholars at that from very, very different viewpoints. But uh, what I would like to focus today is on how domestic economic growth actually is used in, uh, as a way to uh, project a self-representation of China, especially with developing countries. Uh, this is a subfield of studies. I, I'm sure that all of you have come across the term as China model. Uh, there are a, a bunch of different contributions from the China model, uh, China model per se. What I'm looking and what I'm presenting and the subfield that I'm relying on to is actually the one that looks at how the China, uh, to what extent is the China model attractive to foreign audiences. There's a very great article recently published, published by John Ishiyama that actually tries to operationalize this attractiveness if you're interested. There is no agreed definition so far at this stage on the China model per se. But one definition, one aspect that I'm particularly uh, interested in, and I think it's quite relevant to all of this immaterial discussion, is one that Thomas Ambrosio actually stated in an article that is quite old now, it's 2012, an art 2012 article, when basically he argued that the China model continues to remain in the eyes of the beholder. And from this, speci this specific reason, I do believe that the China model should be considered also into this immaterial dimension linked to this self-representation that complements economic statecraft. A couple of years ago, this actually has become a full-blown policy for, for China with the Jiang Hao Zhong Guo Wuxi, the tell the China story well policy that Xi Jinping has been operationalizing and institutionalizing through agencies. There are several stories, and we're now in the domain of the narrative power, in the discursive power, the visuals, that's what I do for a living, basically. There are several stories that are tied to the, the China model in diplomatic practice. But I think that when you look at the literature, everything can be condensed into this very broad, so to say, story. And the story is as such, basically following China's lead, other developing countries could experience the same level of socioeconomic growth that China has experienced. That's quite an appealing and I would say also quite attractive story per se. 
And in an effort to give you some, to ground all of the different discussion on the immaterial power and these stories, I would like to share with you a couple of evidence. You were mentioning the fact that giving them pieces and giving evidence that actually uh, help you contextualize how these stories have evolved and have been used into China's practice. This particular story is related to a sub-story related to the China model, a sub-story that is quite popular these days into this all uh, domain of the discursive power, which is the story, the sub-story of China's success in poverty alleviation. I took two different sources to share with you tonight. <coughs> One is a quite established practice of Chinese diplomats to write articles in local newspapers. I'm going to read you very quickly a short extract from an article published at the, uh, in last April, April 2023, by Ambassador Ma Shi Min on Sudanese Voice, which is a local Sudanese newspaper. And an excerpt of, the, of this article states that China provides a successful example for global poverty, handling, ha handling and shares with other countries its experience in building a beautiful world together for common development. Of course, there's a lot of rhetoric here. There are two points that I find particularly interesting, two top ways, so to say. One is the fact that China is depicted as a success story, a successful example, and the other that China shares. That's, in a sense, reiterating a sort of hierarchy into the way that China presents itself and envisions this, this type of economic statecraft, the, the China model. The other example is something that comes from my own field work. I was uh, interviewing some of the staff at the Central State Museum at the Republic of Kazakhstan, and we were, I asked them to comment on a 2017 exhibition that they held um, entitled New Look and Achievements uh, on the Great Silk Road. I'll, be very quick, this, uh, I'll very quickly read through this, this extract. And this, this member of the staff of the museum was telling me that we carried out an interesting project with the Consulate General of China. The Consulate General financed the entire exhibition and everything was handled from a collaboration with the Chinese Museum. Everyone remembers it too. Successful exhibitions of China were prepared on how they fight poverty with the help of tourism and how they create opportunities for people in just a few years. That is, this exhibition showed visitors how the state is. It's developing programs to combat poverty, and this photo exhibition was a great success. Again, we find in a completely different context and a different domain, the topos of the China as a successful example, and a suggestion on how to, to in, into the way to reach the same success, we, in this case, through tourism. So what are these two examples are telling us? That the image, in my opinion, the, of an economic success story is at the, core, at the core of diplomatic relations. This is something that has been supporting the Belt and Road Initiative and as probably uh, my expectation is that this is going to continue to support new initiatives like the Global Development Initiative that was just launched. And a major takeaway from all of this is the fact that these narratives, these visualizations are so uh, intrinsic into the economic statecraft that any domestic economic slowdown may have a domino effect not just on the global economy but also onto the whole set, whole route of diplomatic relations that China has been building with the global south. Thank you very much and I think I'm out of time. Sure, okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Really delighted to see a full house here and in such a rainy afternoon in London. So I'm glad to see many of you here. And thank you so much for UCL to have hosted me. My first time to be in this campus. Although myself, I taught at LSE in the last eight years or so before my China House post, never managed to cross the road, come to UCL. So my debut today, if I done horribly, please forgive me. Um, now, where are we? I think Julia and uh, Diana has gone um, extra miles to explaining the terms that China's practice and theories behind economic statecraft. But let's really go back to the basics. Given that we are at university and we are facing the IR students in here, what is the economic statecraft? So economic statecraft, particularly the positive, the positive version of economic statecraft, it is really to using the country's enormous financial resources to extend political influence. America has done that with the Marshall Plan, and China comes with its own version of the Belt and Road Initiative and the Global Development Initiative, and then by using its sufficient financial resources 
to have the other countries, to make sure the other countries follow what China want and follow America want. This is just the positive story of the economic statecraft. Now the negative version of wealth, more familiar with in here, is the, in terms of a sanction, in terms of the economic squeeze, in terms of economic coercion that China also practiced quite selectively. For example, the recent spat, or I think the run has now gone with the Australian wine, given the downturn of China-Australian relations. So this is the negative version of economic statecraft. So after we clear all that concept, and does that really China just conducting its own economic statecraft for the sake of having the global south on its own side? Of course, there's a large part is all about China's attraction towards the global south, towards the developing countries, given current very much fraught relations between China and the collective West. But I think another layers in here also would involve that China intended to upgrade its export um, growth model. So it's no longer just about China exporting the toys, the lower end manufacturing products, textiles towards other countries, but instead, and what China will be really interested in focusing on in here is to export on electric vehicles, um, nuclear, um, nuclear technology to some extent, um, even this country was once and tried to adapt China's nuclear technology, and also on um, anything to do with the renewable energy. So in the way that helping the economy, even though less counting on export growth model, but hoping to upgrade that sense of export to generating much further revenues to pumping the GDP. So that is also another element of China's economic statecraft. I mean, all this sounds very well on paper, However, I think when it comes to the practice, and there are different set of both domestic and also external challenges in here. Now, I'm going to just to begin to lay out the domestic challenges where we have in here. So it seems like in the West, especially among the Western strategy community, well, when we come to the discussion on China, it always comes into the story that one country, one person, and one voice. And however, I think the reality is really departed away from this very much so-called monolithic entity. And instead, we, even though, yes, we do have one leader, but we're also counting on enormous numbers of enablers, diplomats, economists, strategists, and that try to deliver the very ambitious agenda President Xi Jinping set up. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative, and lately you mentioned the Global Development Initiative as well. Now, having said that, and that would mean within the central administration, you would have various agencies and institutions engaged within crafting this economic statecraft strategy. For example, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, to have that you have the top level design. So Xi Jinping would give the pr pronunciation of the BRI begin to take place, but they all have to waiting for various institutions to, to fit into the contents of the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is only at the central level. And then you also had a, at the provincial level, you have around 34 provinces of China. And every single provinces and provincial leaders would want to show its loyalty to President Xi and has liked to launch some kind of specific campaign related to the Belt and Road. And that is somehow first to show their political loyalty, but also helping the local and provinces to be able to generate revenues and commercial opportunities as well. Then at the end of the day, when you have certain economic initiatives that come from China, and that ended up with a, a soup that was many cooks. So imagine if you have one soup with uh, 34 different cooks, how the soup will taste like. And then of course that would be de really deviated away from what Xi Jinping really wished for. So that sense of domestic coordination, I think that would be really much required in here. I think Julie have done some works on looking to China's sale on enterprises, um, and how they're managing on the one hand to show the political loyalty, but on the other hand, also try to somehow gain certain profits on certain infrastructure projects, but it's very hard to achieve. So on that level of domestic coordination, it's very hard for China. Now, the second challenge in here is the external one. Now, we all know about Chinese foreign policy is essentially, it is not just about the tell China story well. The key thing in here is a good story, you need to have an audience that believe what you say. The trouble for the BRI or for any other economic relation, um, initiatives about China is that largely concerned is more about how China tried to tell that story, but largely forgotten the perception that the rest of the world already having 
towards particular initiative. For example, debt trap diplomacy, although the debt trap, I mean, after we have done several works at Chatham House, the tra debt traps on certain countries don't really exist. But I think that perception has already been well established within the strategic circle, within the policy making um, circle. So I think really China to go forward, to make any of its um, economic initiative to become successful, it is not just about itself. It really have to look into how the others see China firstly, and secondly, how the others based on those existing perception and crafting foreign policies and crafting policies towards China. And I think that's the second, the external challenge that China would have. So how to manage in that perce uh, perception. I think the very last one, um, I'm sure Diana know far more better than I do on this one, which is the current slowing down of the Chinese economy. So each country would have a very limited resources. And then you have to decide where are you going to spend your resources. I mean, for example, the European Union debate endlessly about how and to what extent that would support war in Ukraine. And likewise, the United States also debate about how many layers of support it would be able to offer to Israel in terms of fighting against Hamas. And whereas for China's case, it's also about where China is able to allocate its resources given the current level of economic slowdown. And whether Beijing will be able to continue to provide substantive economic support like what we have experienced in the last 10 years in order to sustain its relationship with many of the developing countries, and that would hoping to buy into China's agenda and the voting for China's preferences within the United Nations. I think that's probably is the biggest unknowing here. So it's not just about China itself. It's also about because of lack of the capability, lack of the physical space that China would having right now, and how that going to have much longer lasting impact to this world. So I live in here and much look forward to hear your comments and questions. And we could also have questions am among ourselves if there's for, for a while before going on to the uh, the audience's questions. Um, I was um, I was wondering about this idea of, of de-dollarization and uh, uh, Diana and uh, uh, an internationalization of the RMB. Um, and they seem like they are uh, maybe different things that the internationalization of the renminbi, establishing it as a reserve currency and all the other ways that, that, that international currencies are used, um, might be uh, very difficult. But perhaps some de-dollarization mightn't be so difficult, in particular if it's, if it's got to do with particular regions. So maybe certain regions of the world can be de-dollarized, kind of like the splinter net, but for uh, economics. Does that make any sense in terms of the ongoing competition, monetary competition between China and the and 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 the rest of um, and, and the and the U.S.? I mean, maybe it's a, maybe it doesn't make sense at all. Your expression suggests that maybe it doesn't, but we'll see. Uh, my expression should have suggested I was thinking of what you were saying. <laughs> Not that it doesn't make sense, but to answer your question, I think I will make a very um, broad statement first, because uh, this really is the nub of the issue in a way. The great decoupling is actually a bifurcation of the world into two spheres of influence, a Chinese one and a US one. And for 30 years or however long since the fall of the Berlin Wall, we have been living in a very different world. And in that period, we became highly integrated to the benefit of a lot of stakeholders in this globalization game. So now, when you look at countries or multinationals, no one wants to pick a side. It's quite hard. And a lot of people still talk about the ability to, to have a multilateral world. My argument is that there is no way we could have a multilateral world because of technology. China and the US are so far ahead in terms of their technological abilities that no one can catch up with them. The EU, India, 
obviously Russia has shown itself to be even more of a basket case after the kind of botched uh, attempt at uh, invading Ukraine. And so whoever is going to be the winner of that technology race will be the hegemon of the future. And because technology has become absolutely permeated every aspect of our life, there is no way we could sort of separate what constitutes a threat to national security. And so then almost everything becomes a weapon. And that, I think, is the fundamental driver of this split. And loads of places are kicking and screaming and not wanting to, to do it because it's going to be costly for all of us. But it's an ideological confrontation. And in that context, it is absolutely essential for China to ensure that it has its own self-sufficient domain where within this China is self-sufficient and that includes being able to use its own currency as the anchor and the currency uh, that is going to be the dominant. So it's not in some ways we can't think of, um, and often I think a lot of the discussion about de-dollarization is, oh, it will never happen, China will never displace the dollar. China is not trying to displace the dollar in its relationship with the US, if you see what I mean. It is trying to create its own self-sufficient sphere of influence, and the financial aspect of that sphere is based on the yuan. Now, since the invasion of Ukraine, we have had almost sort of an external push towards more uh, or, or a bigger use of the yuan because of the sanctions uh, imposed on Russia. You know, before uh, Iran was uh, in North Korea subject to sanctions, uh, and even interestingly, Russia, even you know, days before the, Russia was planning to invade Ukraine, when they announced in their big speech of friendship the, the deal on gas, I think it was, it was still at that point priced in euros. So even Russia, that was you know, such a big friend of China, was still pricing that deal in euros, not in yuan. Of course, now Russia is pricing and paying <laughs> everything in yuan. I mean, I'm joking. It's not everything. But you see my point. So we now have Iran, Russia, North Korea. Now you might say you know, that's not a big part of the world in totality. Uh, but with China, and then when you start adding, you know, we did this exercise for this report, and it was v very much based on judgment than, than, uh, you know, than any, but, but judgment among a group of people that have very deep experience in all of these regions, uh, of sort of splitting the BRI countries in uh, the ones that signed up, uh, of who's likely out of these countries to end up in China's sphere of influence versus who is not likely. And then when we looked at the size of the financial system that could be created, it was quite equal to the West, um, which is interesting because you know, when you tell this to some people, they actually see this as a sign of stability. Uh, because obviously, if one partner or one, uh, not partner, but one party to this confrontation you know, is distinctly weaker, uh, then that will encourage um, you know, more confrontational behavior. Uh, but again, in quite a lot of the, the rest of these BRI countries, outside of the ones forced by events like Iran, um, or not by events, forced by their own decisions of exploiting the vacuum that this hegemon that can no longer police the world properly, the US, and this hegemon that doesn't want as yet to police anything, <laughs> In that vacuum, all these middle countries or smaller powers are pursuing their own geopolitical initiatives, and it creates huge instability globally. But they, um, you know, these other countries are still, there is a lot to play for of who's going to join and end up joining each sphere of, uh, of influence. So I hope that answered your question of, of how we really have to look at de-dollarization. What's the aim here? And then how will China achieve it? It, 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 um, uh, it really opens up a, a, a can of worms, but a very tasty can of worms, you know, which I would you know, uh, uh, like to dig into. But 
Um, and hopefully that would be, uh, other people will, will, will pick up on that because I want to uh, uh, not to dominate things with my questions too much. Richard. Um, oh, I forgot entirely. I forgot completely about, about this thing. Did you hear nothing of what I was saying? What I was saying wasn't particularly important <laughs> or profound in any case. Um, uh, uh, Julia, um, lots of my, what you were talking about is uh, an issue that lots of my students are really fascinated. You know, I, I get them to come up with their own topics for, um, uh, uh, for essays. And uh, uh, several of them are interested in the idea of China as a neo-colonial power. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if you use precisely that language, but it reminded, what you were talking about, reminded me of that and of the issues. Um, does that make any sense in a way in places like Africa and Central Asia? Is it anything like, I know it depends on what the definition of, 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 of neo-colonial is. So I, I'd say an easy question for me. Um, there is a, really a, an entire line of, researchers that are actually trying to answer this question on neocolonialism. And I think that one thing that I contribute to this is the fact that, as actually Terry was mentioning, it depends on who you ask. And this is something that I also, uh, in my interviews in Kazakhstan, it's something that, not with this many words, but I tried to answer, to ask to my interviewees, and the majority of them was, were discussing the fact that compared to previous experiences of colonialism, this was nothing like mm -hmm. uh, what they experienced in the past because they still had some apparent agency left into this. If we don't ask, if you, we look at um, the, the question of neocolonialism and, and Chinese neocolonialism from a more material perspective, so to say, there are several instances into there is a, a, where you can actually compare uh, experiences of colonial powers to what China has been, in the way that China has been attempting to um, integrate, to present itself into the global south. And I think that one example is, and I think something that uh, a lot of people interested or working into the China and the Global South agenda probably already come across is the fact of the way that China operates into this context, especially with regards to major infrastructural projects that really don't value uh, the local economies but are almost exclusively related towards exporting materials, personnel, machineries directly from outside into those areas. Kazakhstan, for instance, has experienced plenty of protests with regards to how China operates in the country because the perception from the population in the sense had been that China had been building some enclaves within their own territories because you can't actually access those areas. They're completely detached from the local communities. And that, of course, had a sense and presents itself with a sense of the neo-colonial approach. Um, in a final note, also to, to in a sense, um, try to complement a bit of my presentation in that, also in this discussion, and, and Terry is completely right, uh, telling it a certain brand of story, a successful story, a positive story, it's just one hand of how things are actually unfolding in, in reality. The perception question is something that China has not been considering for a very long time. They're trying to do so now. I've been scouting the, the academic literature, and of course, academia in China is not policy advising at all. Uh, it's not, there's not a direct connection. Very, there is some interaction in that sense. There are a lot of studies related to that. And the question of perception has now been uh, discussed, at least in academic circles, into what is the major problem that China has with the Global South. And the, the question is really, the answer is actually related from the Chinese academia to that towards our lack of attention to our perception and how we can actually gauge the per this perception and present a Chinese story that also take in takes into consideration local communities, uh, local expectations towards China. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and, uh, and then for, for you, Che, um, the portrait that you, that you, that you painted of um, uh, the way that economic and I suppose other decision making okay. is made in China, that, that we have this image that it's just she deciding everything, but it's not. He gives quite 
uh, vague policy outlines, there's a lot of interpretation, there's a lot of selectivity, I guess, about which, which province is doing it the way he really wants it, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, uh, partly, uh, I'm, it kind of seems to me that maybe this is also extending abroad, that with China's partnerships with other countries through the BRI, for example, that this is an extension of the same model so that, in a way, these uh, uh, target countries, these partner countries in the BRI, um, become like the partners of central government, such as, for example, provincial governments in, in, in China. Um, so within this system, something that strikes me is that you've got a lot of pluralism. Um, again, something that my students, sometimes the Chinese students, sometimes come to the conclusion that uh, the Chinese system is more likely to succeed because it is authoritarian, because it can make these long-term plans and stick to them. So you've got a particular balance between like uh, de regisme and, uh, uh, and, and, and pluralism. It's a different balance to the one that we've got in, in, in the West. Um, in the current situation, economic, given the current uh, uh, um, challenges that are being faced by China, do you think that this particular balance of, of direction versus pluralism um, is, is an asset or will hold China back? I know a very broad question. It's right. a very broad, and also actually, I feel like I'm I'm coming to the PPE class rather than giving lectures on international relations in here. I'm not going to debate on pluralism or authoritarianism in here. But I think what um, what presidency really want is to make sure, firstly, the story of BRI won't become a failure. Firstly, and secondly, what we have also noticed that Beijing has been begun to quietly dial down the Belt and Road Initiative from back to, if I do remember, five years ago, um, during the, uh, not five years ago, even seven years ago, in the 19th Party Congress. And the BRR has been featured quite substantively in the party literature. Um, I'm talking about party literature in here. You may be laughing at me. Why are you reading propaganda all the time? Actually, it is not a propaganda. It's the policy document for, I think, for any sinologist have to go through line by line. And every single change of those party literature would be reflecting on the policy change of the senior um, of the senior leadership in the within the party, and then for the BRI and um, back to 2017, it was the entire paragraph about the Belt and Road Initiative. And then at 2022, when they convened again five years after, there was only half sentence mentioned regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. And then that clearly, firstly, has shown the importance, the significance has been dialed down. And secondly, Beijing is no longer considered this as being something to do with geostrategic initiative and ambition that China initially planned, but instead it would consider the Belt and Road Initiative as being a trading platform for China's neighboring countries uh, that work together with the provincial governments and hoping provincial governments could using such initiative to generating revenues and local GDPs. So that is the, the change of the story in here. Now, secondly, you may have noticed that back to 2019, Beijing has hosted its second BRI forum um, April 2019, and not a single fresh state capital has been pledged. So they have not really added into a new money into, into the space. And then that also partially explained that after testing the water for several years, and perhaps the Belt and Road Initiative have not really been enjoyed the success as it should be, and hence they should really have to change the direction. So I think it's less about the pluralism we're talking about in here, but on the other hand, perhaps it's that sense of smaller, on a smaller extent of policy flexibilities mm -hmm. that somehow the senior policy leadership still want to pursue. I mean, obviously, this will be more focusing on the economic related issue. I'm not talking about political issues in here. I'm talking about more related to economic diplomacy issue, that sense of flexibility and that sense of debate and still have to be in place. I mean, as I said earlier, is largely to do with how much resources you have and how much you would like to utilize those resources at the best for China. Now, in terms of um, the, where Julia was talking about this um, China-Africa engagement and so on and so forth, I think Beijing has really already passed that phase of so simply treating Africa as a continent as being 
a, a place for exploring its natural resources. But instead, I think given the expanding population within the continent and then also shrinking market for the Chinese uh, companies in the collective West, and the global south has now gradually become market for China. Now, interestingly, speaking with the trade data, and by the end of 2023, actually China trade far more with a non-Western world than the United States and EU added together. So that really explains to you where does economic statecraft come from. May I chip in into may I chip in into answering this question? I was actually just about to invite you to, you know, any of you to make comments on one another. So that's absolutely perfect. And I was delighted that you introduced um, uh, that you were talking about Julia's uh, um, uh, comments, Jeff, uh, for exactly the same reason. So please, please put you ahead. Because you know, I, I one of the questions you asked at the start was, you know, what's going to happen to China's growth model? Um, you know, is China going to grow as fast as in the past? Can it? Um, should it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so, what you asked is quite important. Uh, what you um, sort of asked next, <laughs> because. There is this perception that the authoritarian regime, the top-down, longer horizon regimes can plan better for the future and are not dependent on the short-term four or five-year political cycles of the West. And uh, there are some who attribute China's success to that. Actually, most of the time this is uh, you know, the standard answer that you would get from a Chinese person if you uh, ask them in front of a Western audience. My students, for example. Um, yes. Uh, which but, is not the answer I gave. <laughs> uh, which is not the answer you gave, and, and credit to you, because I know how hard, actually, it is to be in, that, in your position. Um, so um, that's remarkable. Um, so I, I really, really value your opinion, because... You know how to you know how to work within the constraints of being here and uh, uh, coming from China and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyway, the point is that that has not been the success story of China. It's not the top down some sort of ivory tower thinking that they decide this is how it should be done. Let's uh, let's all do it. It is always posed as a question and as an opinion. You know, we think this is the problem. And let's go and investigate how you, we're going to solve it. And then all these locality, you know, local governments compete with each other with the trial and error method of trying to solve these problems. And China always approaches it with pilots. And then a successful model emerges. And then it gets rolled out. That actually has been, to my mind, the critical feature of the success of China's model. And even if you go back in time, I would argue that that's why the Industrial Revolution, in a way, happened in the West at the time uh, it did. It was because you rarely get these eureka moments where you, know, you invent electricity. It's then being all the small rationalizations that build on it. And for that to happen, you need to kind of give the freedom for trial and error, for making mistakes, etc., etc. Now, in Xi's China, Actually, that is changing. So a key driver for the success is being altered because what is happening is that people are scared to experiment. He has unleashed a relentless, extremely successful anti-corruption campaign. Often these this sort of guidances from the top or questions are very vague, and everyone has to interpret them. And you're at a loss how to interpret them and what to do in order to then please, because if you don't please, you know, you're going to go to jail at best. Um, in fact, there is a sort of a perception that, Mao, uh, that, that she's more benevolent leader uh, than Mao uh, was, and uh, some, some Chinese uh, friends were saying that, and I said, but why? Oh, well, he doesn't kill the people. He only puts them to jail. <laughs> I Mao used to kill them all. So anyway, we're going different direction. So this, the, the local officials that had all this freedom to experiment and fail and find solutions 
uh, are actually now under tremendous stress because she is also putting the pressure experiment and give me solutions, but give me the right solutions. There is not a lot of scope for failure. And so the incentives driving the behavior of all these plurality that you described have changed fundamentally under she for the worst. Or for the worst, uh, for the worst. Yes, sure, okay. Um, so, um, oh, that's a lot, so let me see. Here, so one, two, three, four, and we take five, but we take the first three, okay? And then we go on to the, the, um, uh, to the uh, next ones. Um, so you were first, I think. Oh, and, yeah. and everybody, when, when um, uh, uh, give, your, give your, you know, where you're from and your name, um, unless you've got a very good reason not to, okay? <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, so for Dr. Yuji, um, thank you so much for um, the talk. Um, I was uh, reading about uh, this phenomenon of people that had um, moved from the countryside to the cities and they became like uh, interpre small entrepreneurs and they are really contributing to the economy. But now uh, these people are facing some hardship on like um, they, 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 their house got expropriated or their business and like this semi-authoritarian, like this authoritarian behavior by the state is pushing a lot of entrepreneurs um, out uh, of China and creating like sort of a drain, brain drain. How harsh do you think it is or like how uh, much is this influencing to the um, economic decline? Okay, two others, and then we'll let's see. If there's two others here. Well, you the next. Okay, the two of you then. Um, you okay? You you, you next. Then, <laughs> right? yeah. it's all right. One person that <laughs> so my name is Riyad. I work in finance. So my uh, question would be related to uh, financial statecraft because we mentioned. Uh, I know maybe I'm being off topic. We talk about economy uh, statecraft, but don't you think that financial statecraft? play a greater role in the relation between, the, um, between China and the US, and also on the possibility of decoupling that, which I think will never happen, cause of the um, uh, capital market integration between the US and China. So my question is, where do you see the role of financial statecraft and capital market in uh, decoupling and uh, uh, the place of China in the between uh, sin uh, the, within the Sino-American relationship, that makes sense. Hi, thank you very much to the panel. It's been a very interesting discussion so far. My name is Patrick Flynn, and I'm a visitor to UCL this evening. Um, I just had a question around um, the success of the industrial policy so far. So it's been, you know, they've, they've done. You know, huge things on the electrical wheel front and solar panels front, and you know they're 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 going to be market leaders in 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 those areas, if not already. Um, but the West is coming back and being you know there's talk of you know the the EU are doing an investigation and, and wondering if they can um, you know maybe put some taxes on them for for subsidising so much and things like that. Um, it, they they seem now to be as your your point about them trading so much with the global south. Are they going to pivot towards being a producer for the Global South to continue their growth model? And then I just want a, a quick question on the, their demographics and whether this new, um, the younger generation, can turn into the consumer um, that, that, that I guess that they're, 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 trying to, they're trying to have. Pass it along, yeah. Pass thank it. you. Um, no, thank you, everyone. You, we'll take those three, and then you'll be the next batch, OK? No, she should have it because she's really, she's really, she's really, she's really So who wants to? Okay, yeah, let me, let me go through the first question on the, essentially you asked me about the Common Prosperity Initiative that Xi Jinping introduced back to August 2021. Um, the initiative itself is actually uh, put on the paper, uh, makes sense. Essentially about income reallocation, income and resource redistribution and pivot more into the rural area and for those who 
families and household have not really been benefited from the previous round of economic reform. So that having said, is on the paper, it reads very well. But when it comes to the practice, I think what the government has really been aiming at is aiming at the sectors with extremely high profit margin. So namely fintech, I'm not talking about technology, but fintech, there's a difference on that. And secondly, after tutorial and the property sector, the three sectors that had creating huge wealth of China and somehow engineered the economic growth. But that is exactly what the government doesn't want to have. It doesn't want to over rely on towards the property sector. It doesn't over rely on towards the um, fintech sector, for example. That's not necessarily boosting the productivity of the country, but then um, not employing sufficient people. So this is the part of the reason I think the um, I think President Xi and his um, Politburo members really gone after those sectors. And the way we're talking about is those who have emerged from the countryside and went to the city and become the first generation of a startup and so on and so forth. Some of them are successful story, some others are not. I mean, like any other businesses like you have in any other country. So I would not necessarily consider this something a disappointment towards society. I think largely, People in the West, when you interact with the Chinese population, you usually interact with people from uh, coastal areas. Yep, less likely to interact with people from third or fourth tier cities or rural areas. And their view of the world and their perception towards the leadership are quite different from the coastal area. So I think that's also part of the reason led into what we're seeing talking about, you know, the Chinese economy is really on the brink of enormous difficulty. Whereas on the other hand, the rural population seems to become, feel themselves far more, very much in favor by presidency and uh, the others. So that different kind of core support groups, we may call it in here. If you're just using the similar um, analogy in here, think about who are the core supporters of President Trump in the United States, the Rust Belt of the United States. And then we, really, I mean, for big countries like both like China and the United States, you really have to dial down which aspect and which sector are you talking about in here? Yeah. So headline can always be quite deceptive yeah, on that regard. Mm. Um, who's picking up to the questions here? I'm happy to address uh, the question that followed. Um, well, I have a lot to say to <laughs> the answer to your question, but I'll, um, I mean, the financial uh, market is very much part of the economy. Integ integral part. So there is no separating the two. Uh, when we looked at uh, the great decoupling, we kind of, and it's all encompassing, split it into the three T's. Trade war, because that's what Trump initiated, although the decoupling was started by China, not by the US. China was first trying to pursue the self-sufficiency and et cetera, et cetera. Then tech war, anything to do about technology, and then Taiwan war. So is this uh, contest going to turn kinetic and now we're going to see China and the US um, uh, sort of battle it out militarily. Of course, Taiwan was, is, is the most um, obvious, big, huge point of contention between the two. Within the trade wars, it's anything to do with the economy and a very, very big part of it is capital markets. When you think about national security, uh, I remember the story that uh, when the two planes hit the towers uh, in uh, New York, when Alan Greenspan found out about it, his first question was, is the payment system okay? So you can understand the importance of the global payment system to uh, national security. So there's no way if we're bifurcating that we're not going to bifurcate in capital markets as well. Um, and again, that is a forecast <laughs> that is not internalized in markets as yet, even though you can see from both sides of the equation uh, very active efforts to do so. Whether it's the US saying, why should we give uh, pension money of uh, US citizens to enable the PLA or China's rise more generally, or whether it's from the perspective of China saying we're going to create our own payment system, you know, no data should be taken out of China, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and you know, financial organizations in particular um, will, 
it's, it's just how, how are you going to deal with that? Um, it's, it's extremely hard. So it will be bifurcating too. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to comment on the industrial policy per se. Oh, sorry. On the industrial policy per se, but one thing that I can contribute, and maybe my colleagues can do that for me, um, one thing that I can contribute is on your question on whether China would be willing or to pursue to become a producer for the global south. And from the perspective, when I look at this interaction, I would say that China has an awareness about the domestic political costs for political elites in the global south into a resorting towards a dynamic that doesn't value local economies. This is something that has been discussed in policy papers in China, and there is thus a wariness into how the perception of, of overflowing local economies with uh, Chinese goods and services would entail for the overarching um, range of diplomatic relations that China has, which is something that China has been doing in the past, something that has been studied, something that has been perceived, and something that uh, the Global South, and of course, Global South is a huge term, but bear with me at this stage, these generalizations. The Global South has had also the chance and opportunity to fight back. And China, from what we know into, her, into the diplomatic practice of the country, learns from history, learns from its own history and its own historical practice. Trial and error, as Diana was saying. And this is something that's definitely going to be taken into consideration. We just have minutes left, but if you can pose your question really quickly, and I'll give you a chance as well. Very, very okay, quick thank you. Um, so, basic, I'm an intelligence analyst uh, for Africa in, uh, at Dragonfly, and uh, we're, it's interesting to hear your perspective because I often look at African perceptions of China. And uh, ODA, official de development assistance from the West, has gone down. Uh, countries are heavily indebted. Um, China has come in um, and has made some very strategic investments, for instance, in 5G technology data centers across the African continent, um, which I think is really going to, well, is, is building a very strategic advantage. Um, for instance, if there is this competition between the US, uh, then half of oh, most sorry, of Madam, what's your question? Uh, my question is, basically, um, well, I'm looking at what the with the Chinese currency, what I'd like to understand is where will we see the BRICS currency swap or these kinds of uh, initiatives becoming a reality first? Um, for African countries to get out of debt, the current system isn't working. Um, so I'd like to understand, for instance, specific investments in the Chinese currency. Is that a possibility? Um, you've ma made some mention of it, but I was wondering if we could get specifically a look at Africa. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Um, there's been comments around the funds that China have put into the Global South and issues around debt trap, whether or not it exists, and enclaves and what have you. The US and the European Union are preparing, I think, their own big package of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure investment for, for developing countries as well. Do we think that will be effective at countering the narrative or furthering a, a Western narrative in the Global South? And will China respond by providing more humanitarian-based aid or concessional loans as opposed to commercial as it is, is right now? Thanks. So who wants to, um, who wants to take these? It should be very brief because we've got one minute left. Okay, sure. Let me let me go through the um, the, the question. Um, of course, you have the global gateway, and then you also have what build back better world. I mean, at G7 uh, in UK, um, the United States referring to. But I think ultimately, this would be now become more competitive market that would counting on countries in Africa, countries in Latin America, in terms of themselves become agency to choose which one they would really go for. So I think competition is out, and we haven't seen the clear result yet. Now, secondly, whether China would be offering more humanitarian assistance or more to do with the financial loans, I think let's, if we go back to the Global Development Initiative, which in terms of the total amount of money that China willing to spend is much smaller than the BRI, but I think much of the emphasis has been given on much smaller humanitarian assistance and less so on financial assistance for that sense. 
Uh, meanwhile, I really didn't understand your question. I'm so sorry. So um, I don't know how the BRICS to. Swap will become a reality. What's the, the BRICS, BRICS swap? swap? The BRICS currency swap. The BRICS uh, currency swap? Uh, yes, Brazil, Russia, India, China. So no, no, that I know what BRICS is, but. Oh, there's, there's an no initiative currency. called the currency swap, but that's all right. That's so all right. I think there was, you know, I think what you're getting at is probably this discussion of whether the BRICS countries can, can have their own. Uh, uh, kind of currency currency uh, union or something like this, based on what though? Or is it is the yuan going to be a, a leading currency? Is it the Indian rupee? Is, are they going to invent a new currency that is going to be their currency? This, I think, is very fanciful because um, you have to look at this first and foremost from the geopolitical lens. You know, in the BRICS, you have India. India is <laughs> not anywhere near an ally uh, of China. And why would it be agreeing you know, to anything like that? Uh, you can also argue that um, the Mo European Monetary Union is, is a very real life example of how the thing doesn't work unless you ultimately have a fiscal and a really ultimately political union and the Europeans have not gotten there yet. So, so these this five random countries select, put together in random, I mean, you know, it's become such a nice acronym and the guy that invented it, I forgot his name, has, you know, made his sort of life out I, I of think, it. I think he said, he said himself that this is not... Even really now, he happened. says it, really, you can't bandy them together. So that is unrealistic. But um, whether we can create a financial system or whether there can be a subsystem that China is in charge of, and that, that is a different question. And then the African countries have to decide, do we go with that one or that one? We better finish up now because we're, we're really uh, more than out of time. Um, before we thank our speakers, um, the um, policy and practice event uh, next week is on homelessness in Britain, an agenda for change. So that's the 29th, or is it the 29th? Uh, you can sign up for it via our website in Eventbrite. Um, please follow us on Twitter or Instagram if you don't already. Our handle is UCLSPP. Um, so that's where we announce all our, uh, our uh, forthcoming events, and you're able to keep up to date with latest research as well. Um, and then, uh, so thank you all for coming and joining us, and thanks our, to our speakers. Thank you.